Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, January 27, 2019. We are still in Unit 2, which is entitled Loving God and Trusting Christ. And from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is Sacrificial Love. A devotional reading comes from Psalm 119, verses 65 to 72. Our background scripture, Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11. And our printed passage is Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11. The adult quarterly lesson has three major divisions after the introduction. The first is Be Humble. And that's covered between verses uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 4. The second is Behave Like Christ. That's covered between chapter 2, verses 5 and 8. And the third division is Humble Jesus Exalted. And that's covered between verses 9 and 11. From the standard commentary, let me back up here, uh, our lesson aims from the quarterly, or number one, study the saving work of Christ as it is presented in the Christological hymn of Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Number two, Aspire to serve others by following Jesus' example of humility and sacrifice. And number three, grow in the ability to place the needs of others before your own. And we, even as Christians, uh, we know that that is difficult to do. Uh, we are selfish by nature, and of course we have to war daily with our, our, unre our human nature, if you will. From the standard commentary, the lesson title is Imitate Christ. And our additional uh, aims are, number one, describe the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus as the climax of God's self-revelation. Number two, explain how Jesus' self-sacrifice defines true human existence. And number three, express ways and conviction to imitate Christ in relationships, in our relationships one with another. Now before we read through our lesson text, um, just like to give a little a little background um, as we learned last week uh, Paul uh, had a close relationship with the church at Philippi and uh, this letter was written during his first imprisonment in Rome and uh, it, as we said uh, last uh, uh, week uh, it is uh, basically about uh, joy, the lesson, or the, the, the epistle basically talks about the joy and the fellowship that we can have one with another. And this, this chapter in particular uh, tells us how we can do that by having the mind, by having the heart and the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we, we know uh, the very word Christians that we are called by, means to be Christ-like. Uh, we know from Acts, the uh, believers were first called Christians at Antioch, and that is because they acted like Christ. They had the mind of Christ, and they demonstrated that in their, in their attitudes and their actions one toward another. Now, our lesson text begins at verse 1 of chapter 2, and it says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ and, and, and if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy. And of course, uh, when we um, 
begin a passage or begin a verse that begins with if, we need to find out what the if is there for, for we really need to back up to the first, uh, I'm sorry, the last uh, four verses of chapter one. And I'd like to read those very quickly. And it says, only let your conversation, that is your behavior, be as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ or the good news of Jesus Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversary, which is to them an evident token of perdition or being lost, if you will, but you, but to you rather of salvation and that of God, that salvation given of God. Verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. If you recall uh, the, the first chapter from my lesson from last week, the first chapter uh, of Philippians dealt uh, uh, substantially with uh, Christ, I mean, uh, Paul explaining why he was in prison and how he interpreted his imprisonment and how it uh, was uh, furthering the spread of the gospel. And he wanted and others were being emboldened by his imprisonment to preach the gospel, some uh, with the wrong intentions, but and some out of love with the right intentions. And whether the wrong intentions or not, the gospel was being spread. So we're going to begin, uh, we're going to pick up again at uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and I'll read our lesson text, and then we'll, we'll have some verse-by-verse -verse discussion. So again, verse uh, 1 says, if there, be, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Wherefore God and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Our Father, we do thank and praise you again for this day, Lord. We thank you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And we pray, Lord, that you'd give us a clearer understanding of your word, Lord. And as we understand it, Lord, help us to apply it to our hearts. Lord, help us to be obedient to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Just another word uh, or two in the way of uh, background. Um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, uh, is a poetic uh passage really uh, uh, referred to as a song and um, many believe it was one of the early church uh, or Christian hymns and uh, there are other uh, uh, passages in the Bible that in the New Testament in particular that were considered to be uh, ancient uh, uh, Christian hymns um, such as uh, the Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 1 to 14 Colossians 1, 
15 to 20, and 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. Um, this, uh, again, is considered to be a, a song or hymn that, that focuses on uh, the incarnation of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without getting uh, uh, too technical here, uh, it really uh, uh, comes from an interpretation of canonic uh, theology, uh, again, that focuses on the, the person of uh, Christ uh, and his self-limitation uh, or his emptying of himself, of his divine uh, prerogatives. And we'll say more about that when we get to that uh, portion of our, our text, our lesson text. But let's jump in at verse 1. And let's look at 1a, and it says, if there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ... Uh, this word, if, and there are a number of if-then statements made by Paul, uh, does not uh, mean uh, uh, that there's some doubt about it. Uh, it could have better been interpreted or could have been interpreted since, but there's no doubt about it. Paul is just drawing some connections between uh, since this is the case, then this must also be. So he says, if or since there uh, or consolation is consolation in Christ. And the word uh, consolation here is translated uh, from uh, a word that means comfort. Uh, it means comfort. It can also mean uh, exhortation. Uh, and Paul is saying, if or since there there is comfort and consultation by being in Christ, that is, being in his body, being a born-again believer and part of his body. Uh, and and, and uh, it, it means also uh, associated with God's His love expressed through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, then what part C says, if any comfort of love, uh, if any comfort, Comfort of God's love, that is, and God's love is, is certainly expressed through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, John three sixteen, we recall says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten, or His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life." So there's there's comfort in the love of God expressed through the work of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Part C says, if any fellowship of the Spirit, and this word fellowship really uh, signifies or indicates uh, a, a, a sense of connection between people, uh, and we not, we're not we not talking about a connection uh, that is merely based on uh, association or knowledge of one another or even friendship but the connection between Christians is of the spirit okay uh, the spirit we are we we are indwelt by the same spirit and the spirit binds us together as, as believers in Jesus Christ and binds us together as part of his body um, and we can see the connection uh, in Really, Paul's uh, uh, benediction at the end of Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter thirteen, verse fourteen reads: "The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all." So there's a connection between uh, God's grace, of course, uh, the love, uh, the grace of rather of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion or fellowship of the Holy Spirit. 1D says, If any bowels of mercy, I think that word bowels kind of throws some people off sometimes, but it is basically talking about um, affection or uh, something something that's uh, uh, a, a deep-rooted uh, feeling uh, 
and and from the uh, NIV is translated, if any, tenderness and compassion. Uh, but it's something that comes from deep within. It's something that uh, is uh, a compassion uh, that moves a person to do something about the circumstances of someone else. So he's saying if there are bowels of mercy, if there are all these things, these four things that he lists between parts A and part D, then 2A, verse 2A says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. So what is he saying? He's saying uh, the result of these things, if you have those things that he mentioned in verse 1, consolation in Christ, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, bowels of mercy, then the the response, the right response to those things is to receive, and having received these gracious gifts from God, is what Paul is about to to share now. Uh, Be like-minded like-minded or thinking the same thing. Uh, And we can go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 to to, to get a better idea of what's what's intended here, what's being said here. Uh, Better still, uh, let's take a look at Romans chapter 15, verse 5, which reads, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Jesus Christ. In other words, have the same mind about Christ and the things of Christ. And we're going to, when we get down to verse 5, we're going to see uh, uh, the, the, what, what Paul is really uh, working up to uh, in these uh, early, early verses. So verse uh, part uh, B of verse 2 says, having the same love. Now this, this is the, the action uh, part of having the same mind. Uh, and uh, and what, it's, what it's saying is the love that the readers have received from Christ, uh, the love that comforts and encourages them, uh, continually uh, must now dictate their actions toward one another. That this love must motivate their actions. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which really talks about how everything we do, whatever we do, should be motivated by love. You know, it begins with, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I'm a gong. I'm a sounding uh, symbol or gong. I'm just noise. And it goes on to talk about what we might do uh, if it's not motivated by love being useless. Part C says, being of one accord. Basically, it means sharing the same attitudes and perspectives. Uh, and and it doesn't mean that we uh, don't have any independent thought. Let's not let's not think that. And we might think that uh, reading Part D, which says of the same mind, it's not talking about us being um, uh, basically cookie cutters in in, in 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 every in every essential way, uh, uh, not having any individualism. But it's really it's speaking about having the same understanding of Christ. Uh, and, and and that understanding really controlling or transforming us initially and then controlling every aspect of our life inside and out. And, and first it's going to start with the inside, with our mind. And we remember the Lord Jesus saying that as a man thinketh, he is. And everything uh, good or evil begins with our mind, the attitude of our mind. When we get over to chapter fifth, I'm sorry, chapter four in Philippians, uh, there's a, a beautiful uh, a couple of verses. Uh, uh, verse uh, verse eight, uh, actually verse um, yeah, verse eight, which talks about uh, how we are to put what we are to put in our minds. 
Uh, if we put the right things in our minds, then we displace the wrong things. We cannot have uh, two things dominating our minds at one time. And verse 8 of chapter 4 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So every good thing or evil thing begins with our mind and the attitude of our mind. Verse 3a says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Through strife or vain glory. From the NIV, it reads, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Uh, now, wh what are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, uh, strife, meaning uh, really hostile division among people. Unfortunately, there's too much of that, um, uh, even in our churches. There's, there's certainly uh, too much of that in our personal interactions with, with friends, whether they be fellow believers or not, uh, and relatives. But there's too much of this in our church. Uh, and there's division, there's opposition uh, to the Christ-like, humble life, uh, and that's what's meant by, by strife here. And he's saying don't do anything motivated or that's going to produce strife, okay? Uh, and, 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 and that's also paired with this, this term vain glory, uh, which really is, is a selfish pursuit. Of, of empty praise uh, for oneself uh, at the expense of others, the commentator says here. So, uh, and again, that's the vain conceit uh, translated. That's the, 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 the way it's translated in the NIV that we are not to strive for. Part B says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Lowliness of mind. What are we talking about there? It's really talking about humility. That that expression of those terms could have been translated humility, uh, or uh, it really he's exhorting the believers to be humble. And obviously, uh, it is hum humbleness is not something that you uh, uh, boast of, <laughs> boast that you are. Uh, you know, I, I used to chuckle a bit when I when I would hear people pray and, and, and they say, Lord, I'm coming to you as humbly as I know how. You know, well, that really doesn't need to be expressed. Uh, and I have defined um, a humbleness uh, in uh, the classes that I teach as really knowing your uh, position uh recognizing that you are nothing, you have nothing, and you can do nothing apart from God. It's having a proper view of your position relative to God, okay? And again, when we do, we recognize that we can do nothing apart from God, and everything that we have, he's given to us. When it says esteem others better than themselves, it means really to value them uh, above yourself. And that's that's difficult, as I said, for us to do, even as believers, because um, uh, and we can't do that in our own strength. Our human nature is selfish, okay? We have to do that uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit or with the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're we're uh, actually told to, to walk in the Spirit, uh, to walk in the by the enablement of the, of the Spirit, and we will not obey the lust of our flesh, which includes selfishness and doing those things to better ourselves at the expense of others or to make us e even look better sometimes at the expense of others. And it's difficult for us to do, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can and should do this. And I should say here, you know, these are not suggestions, really. These are really instructions uh, for Christian living here. Uh, verse 4 <clears throat> says, uh, 
Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let's take a look at that um, in the NIV, and it says, uh, Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, does this mean uh, we are uh, not to have any care or concern about our meeting our needs uh, or our families uh, and that we are to be solely uh, devoted to meeting the needs of others? No, I don't think so. But it means we are to uh, to provide for the needs of others as God enables us to. It says, look not on the on your needs only but also the verse reads again from the king james look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others so certainly you're going to provide for your own needs and this doesn't mean in a in a gluttonous uh fashion or hoarding fashion but it means we are to provide for our necessities but also look out to provide for the necessities of others as well. Now then we get into the second division of uh, both outlines uh, from the standard, the revelation of selflessness, beginning at verse 5, and from the quarterly, from the adult quarterly, behave like Christ. And this passage is between uh, verses 5 and and verse 8. So verse 5 reads, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And again, Paul is expressing the mind. Uh, it for the commentator says here, that The humble life is first a way of thinking about ourselves and others. Then he states directly that our minds must be like Christ's mind. And he's going to go on and tell us what Christ's mind was like or is like, if you will. But our, 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 our life, our humble life uh, style, if you will, begins with, as I said, the, the attitude of our mind. And verse 6 says who being in the form of God thought so we're we're getting into Christ's mind here thought it not robbery to be equal with God let's look at verse 6 in the NIV which reads who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage now uh he, he uh, of course, Jesus was in heaven with God the Father, equal in uh, sharing all the divine attributes as the Father and the Holy Spirit, those being uh, omnipotence or omnipotence, all powerfulness, omniscience, all knowledge, and omnipresence everywhere at once, or being capable of being everywhere at once. But he didn't think... Uh, having uh, 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 being God and having all the divine prerogatives of God something to be used to his advantage and 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 he's, he's going to go on that and that that was being fully equal with God uh, before he emptied himself or divested himself of some of his divine prerogatives and this word uh, form actually comes from uh, a Greek word, morphe, morphe, which is related to another word, schema, uh, and, it, and it means uh, to appear uh, with uh, the same f fashion. It means fashion, it means whole or outward appearance, uh, and uh, it means, and, it, and it's, it's an objective uh, Form or fashion. In, in other words, it doesn't doesn't matter whether it's seen or or not. It is the the natural form of something, and and that is what uh, 
a Christ is saying being in the natural form, his natural form, which is in glory uh, with the Father and Spirit, uh, God is Spirit. Uh, he didn't think that something, and in glory, of course, something to be uh, used for his advantage. Uh, let's go on. Verse uh, 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, Christ making himself of no reputation, uh, literally translated, uh, he emptied him, is, he emptied himself. Uh, what did he empty himself of? Uh, he emptied himself of, of his divine, again, prerogatives, um, a part of his divine, uh, nature, if you will, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. He did not lose any of his divine nature, but he actually set aside uh, some of his, uh, again, um, deity, aspects of his deity, so that he could suffer, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for men, as we're going to see here um, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. So it, it says he takes upon him the form of a servant. And again, that word uh, could more literally be translated bond slave, or one who serves by compulsion, you know, not voluntarily, even though we know Christ took on this role and came in the flesh willingly. But we know he was also obedient to God, even unto death, to God the Father, even unto death. Uh, as a bond servant would be or bond slave would be. Isaiah um, spoke about the coming of this servant of the Lord in uh, Isaiah 53, verses 3 and verses 11. Uh, verse 8 says, before we go to verse 8, uh, I'm sorry, it said, he was made in the likeness of men. And that really means uh, he became fully human, okay? Uh, he was uh, fully God, uh, and still, and yet he became fully human. Uh, and, and we can't explain that. Uh, we can't understand how God could be uh, fully man and fully human, but we are simply to believe that because that is what the Bible reveals to us. And, and, and all we can possibly know about God is what he reveals to us through his word and through his creation. And being human, uh, we know simply reading the Gospels that he was able to experience uh, everything that humans experience, including temptation, suffering, uh, even death. Uh, and and he became through his humanity the perfect sacrifice for man for humankind. Now we'll go to verse eight. And being found in fashion or schema or morphe as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now Christ. Lord himself, Paul is talking about Christ lowering himself, self-lowering himself and becoming human. Uh, and uh, that, of course, is the incarnation, was the incarnation or coming in flesh. Uh, but the climax of his humbling was the acceptance of death and even death on the cross for us, for the sake of others. And we know the it wasn't uh, uh, a, um, uh, a, uh, an easy death. Uh, the, the cross uh, at the time uh, Christ hung on it uh, had been perfect. It was created, that form of execution, torturous form of execution, was uh, developed by the Persians but perfected by the Romans. It was the most hideous and painful form of, of death. Uh, it, it was torturous and it was an agonizing death and humiliating as well. As we said uh, last week, uh, when Christ hung on the cross, it was 
a shame. It was a humiliation. Uh, the in, in the crucifixes that you see, uh, uh, the creators are, are uh, kind enough to put a, a modest loincloth on him, but but crucified uh, victims, victims of crucifixion were hung naked with their crimes nailed on the cross above them. So this humbling, this was the ultimate act of humiliation uh, when he surrendered everything uh, to the will of God the Father. Verse 9. Wherefore, or therefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now, well, um, the, uh, those who looked on Christ, uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests, looked at it as being something shameful, and they looked at uh, Christ as being unable to save himself, and a hypocrite or a fraud, or so they uh, wanted him to appear to to all. Uh, uh, God looked at it as something glorious, uh, and, and 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 actually Christ spoke of him glorifying the Father in his death, uh, and so God exalts him, uh, and 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 we're told by uh, by Christ himself. If we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. And so God exalts him. What does that mean? That means to lift up, uh, exalted him, and he gave him a name which is above every name. And that name could only be God. Uh, when, when God the Father exalted Christ, it means he actually restored him to his exalted position at his right hand and we know that that is the place of honor uh, and so he was exalted to the place of God and given the name of God which is of course the name that is the only name that is above every name that's the name of God verse 10 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven or those in heaven of things in earth are those on the earth and things under the earth. And that covers it all, right? This, this uh, recognition of Jesus uh, as being above all is something that is going to be recognized by everything that exists. Things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. From Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, we read, I have sworn by myself the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear or confess. Now this is uh, God speaking of himself and how that he is going to be honored or reverenced. And of course, he uh, and God, uh, he and the Lord Jesus Christ, rather, uh, receive the same honor and the same recognition of God. And that's what we're seeing here in verse 10. Everything that exists is going to bow the knee. Now, some uh, unwillingly or not having done so, in their earthly life, we're talking about at the judgment now, and some, of course, joyfully, but whether uh, resistant or not, whether having bowed the knee uh, or humbled oneself to the Lord Jesus Christ in their life or not, they're going to at the judgment. When you have a moment, read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, also Colossians chapter 1 verses 18 to 20 and I'm going to just read uh, verse 20 of Colossians chapter 1 which which says and having made peace through the blood of his Christ his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven to reconcile means to be made right with. All things are going to be made right with Christ. 
And, and the previous verse, verse 19, says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Everything is going to be accounted for and reconciled in Christ. Chapter, and let's move on to our final verse, verse uh, 11, and it says, And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that's Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Anointed is Lord, the controller of all. Now, uh, throughout the Roman Empire during Paul's time, um, the subjects and citizens, uh, to show their loyalty and to identify themselves uh, as Romans and subjects of subjects uh, of the the Caesar or the Emperor, they would proclaim uh, Caesar as Lord. Uh, but and so that, that's one of the reasons the Christians stuck out the way they did in the Roman Empire because they recognized that Christ and Christ alone is Lord, and that was the greatest uh, confession they could make. So the word Lord in this in this context means ruler, means absolute controller, uh, potentate, uh, and he says to the glory of God the Father. They're going to the tongues are going to confess, again, some uh, willingly, some having done so in their life, but some recognizing, unfortunately, uh, at the point of their, their doom, uh, that he was truly Lord and, uh, and is Lord, was truly Lord throughout their lives and is Lord and will rule throughout uh, eternity with, and the saints will rule, uh, will uh, be in his presence so so how does how does this bring glory to God the Father? How does this confession of Jesus as Lord bring glory to God the Father? Well, God achieves his purpose uh, for mankind uh, and 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 he expresses his tr- true nature uh, and that is of love by not destroying his rebellious uh, uh, cre- uh, humans, uh, humanity, but by sending his son, his beloved son, his divine son, to become human, experience uh, pain, uh, the pain of death uh, uh, for the sake of others, and receive life again as God's gift. And we're talking about eternal life here. So God's purpose, ultimate purpose for mankind, the redemption of mankind, was fulfilled through what the Lord Jesus did. And again, ultimately, by him being exalted, by his name, by him being confessed as, uh, as Lord, uh, is really the ultimate realization of God's purpose for the redemption or uh, goal for the redemption of mankind. Now, uh, in conclusion, let's, let's go back and let's take a few steps back and look at what the overall objective of this passage was. Uh, Paul is basically trying to explain to the Philippians, and by extension all the churches, how they are to live one with another. Uh, We cannot do that uh, the way God intends for us to operating by our own, according to our own human nature. We really have to have the, the power of the Holy Spirit and the mind of Christ in order for us to esteem others better than ourselves, okay, to love one another the way uh, God intends for us to, not to have the strife and divisions. And, and let's, let's, let's understand that uh, our service to God has to do with are serving one another. As I've said in the past, God doesn't need anything from us except our faith. Uh, he, the cattle on a thousand hills are his. It doesn't matter if you gave 90% of uh, your income uh, to the church. God doesn't need anything for us, but he wants us to uh, express uh, his communicable attributes in this world. Uh, first, toward one another, 
as brothers and sisters in Christ, but then also to the outward world. And so we are to be his body, his, the physical manifestation of Christ on earth. And the, the only way we can uh, live the kind of life that he wants us to without strife, without division, without petty jealousies, without taking advantage of one another. In other words, uh, without uh, allowing our human nature to act as it will, is to have the mind of Christ, the humble mind of Christ, and to and the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to live the way he would have us live. So I hope you've learned something. We've learned a bit more about this passage, and may God bless you and keep you.